All right, welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're pulling back the curtain on something pretty incredible, the science of anesthesia. It's this hidden world that actually makes the mind-blowing precision of robotic surgery even possible. So you might think robotic surgery just sort of appeared, but nope, it has this wild origin story. It actually started back in the 80s with NASA, of all places, building remote-controlled gadgets for space. Then the US military looked at that and thought, hey, what if we could do surgery on the battlefield from a safe distance? Fast forward to the 90s, you get early robots like Aesop, which was basically a voice-controlled camera holder. All of that innovation, all those different threads, they all came together to create the Da Vinci system we know today, the one that's totally revolutionized how surgery is done. Okay, so here's what we're gonna cover. First, we'll get into the era of robotic surgery itself. Then, the physiological challenges. This is the juicy part. We'll look at a ventilation strategy for uro slash surgery. And then, an extreme case, liver transplants. And finally, we'll tie it all together with the hidden effort that makes this precision possible. All right, first up, the era of robotic surgery. Let's really get to know the tools behind this modern precision. So the da Vinci system, it's really made of four key parts working in perfect harmony. You've got the surgeon console. I mean, picture this. The surgeon isn't even standing at the table. They're sitting at a console, looking at this incredible 3D high-def view from inside the body. From there, they control the patient cart, which has these four robotic arms holding the instruments. And these aren't just any instruments, they're called endo-wrist instruments, and they can bend and rotate in ways a human wrist just can't. It's incredible dexterity. And finally, the vision cart projects everything in real time for the whole OR team to see, so everyone is on the same page. Okay, so we've got this amazing tech, but and this is a big but, all this minimally invasive magic comes with a hidden cost. It creates some major challenges for the patient's body. So, how does this amazing technology affect our bodies? Well, to make room for the robot to work, you have to create conditions that honestly unleash what you could call a physiological storm inside the patient. It's a controlled storm for sure, but it's a storm all the same. Yeah, just look at the difference here. With traditional open surgery, the body's physiology is, well, pretty normal. But with robotic surgery, it's a whole different ballgame. You're dealing with CO2 insufflation, pumping gas inside the body. You've got intense internal pressure. The patient is often in some pretty extreme positions. All of this puts a ton of stress on the body, especially the respiratory system. So what's causing the storm? It really boils down to two main culprits. First, you've got something called a pneumoperitoneum. Sounds complex, but it just means inflating the abdomen with carbon dioxide gas to create a workspace for the robot. The second thing is the crazy positioning. We're often talking about a steep, head-down tilt, which is called the Trendelenburg position. This literally uses gravity to get organs to fall out of the way of the surgical area. And when you combine those two things, the gas pressure and the steep tilt, man, it hits the body hard. As you can see, the biggest impact, about 40%, is on the respiratory system. The lungs get squished, which can cause parts of them to collapse. Then you've got the cardiovascular system taking a hit. The brain, too. That head-down position increases pressure in the brain and even in the eyes. And on top of all that, the body starts absorbing some of that CO2, which can throw your whole metabolism out of whack. It's this cascade of issues that the anesthesiologist has to juggle constantly. So the big question is, how do you manage the storm? Let's get practical and look at a common scenario, urology or gynecology surgery, where these challenges are front and center. Okay, so the anesthesiologist playbook here is all about a lung protective strategy. They use a few key tools. First is something called PEEP. Think of it like leaving a little bit of air pressure in the lungs at all times, which helps keep them from collapsing under all that abdominal pressure. Then they use a smaller breath, a lower tidal volume, to avoid overstretching and damaging the lungs. And they often switch to a pressure-controlled ventilation mode, which is just a gentler way of delivering breaths that reduces the peak pressure on the airways. It's all about finding that perfect balance. All right, so that's a common case. But what about the extreme? Let's talk about managing a robotic liver transplant. This is where things get incredibly high stakes. You're taking all the challenges we just discussed and adding them to one of the most complex surgeries in medicine. You know, for something this complex, success really begins with choosing the right patient. Not everyone is a candidate. The team looks for very specific things. A BMI under 30, for example. Maybe some laxity in the abdominal wall, which gives the robot more room to work. A lower MELD score, which means the liver disease isn't as advanced. Even the size of the new liver, the graft, has to be just right. 
it's all about stacking the deck in the patient's favor. Now, during the transplant, things get really intense. At some point, the surgeon has to clamp the biggest vein in the body, the inferior vena cava. Doing that would normally stop a huge amount of blood from getting back to the heart, which would be, well, catastrophic. So they use this incredible technique called venovenous bypass, or VVB. It's basically an external plumbing system. A machine pulls blood out from the lower body, completely bypasses the liver and the surgical area, and pumps it right back into circulation near the heart. It's an amazing workaround that keeps the patient's circulation stable during the most critical part of the operation. But what happens if there is a disaster? A major bleed, cardiac arrest. You can't just shove a multi-million dollar robot aside. There is a meticulously planned, highly practiced emergency undocking protocol. The second an emergency is called, it's like a pit crew in action. The bedside assistant pulls the instruments. The scrub tech detaches the arms. The circulator physically moves the massive patient cart away from the table. And through it all, the anesthesiologist is at the head of the bed, leading the resuscitation. It's an all-hands-on-deck, race-against-the-clock maneuver to get open access to the patient. So when you see these headlines about amazing robotic surgeries, it's easy to focus on the machine. But that's only half the story. Because really, the robot's incredible precision is only possible because of the meticulous second-by-second -second balance being maintained by the anesthesiologist. They are the ones navigating that physiological storm, keeping the patient's body perfectly stable, creating this calm sea that allows the surgeon to perform their magic. And this quote really sums it all up perfectly. It says that for anesthesiologists, it's essential to understand the robotic system itself to adjust their practices. And that's the whole point, right? It's not just about putting someone to sleep. It's about being an expert on the interplay between the machine and the human body and making constant, tiny adjustments to make the whole thing safe and successful. So that leaves us with a really interesting question to think about. As this technology keeps evolving, as the robots get smarter, smaller, more capable, what's next for anesthesia? How will that science have to adapt and innovate to keep up? Because one thing's for sure, wherever surgery goes, anesthesia has to be right there with it, making it possible.